Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 11th of March and this quick look ahead to the week beginning the 14th of March with me, Michael Houston. And it's been another volatile week for markets here in Europe. The DAX fell to a 15 month low in the early part of the week before a really huge rally on Wednesday. Um, and the FTSE 100 has also seen a fairly decent recovery after a big fall in the early part of the week. And I think as we look back at the events of the past few days, it's actually quite surprising that we could actually finish the week higher. Um, but does that mean that we're out of the woods? Well, certainly I think if you look in terms of the headline risk, the situation remains very, very fluid. We've seen Brent crude prices this week move up to within touching distance of $140 a barrel. And when I look up, when, I, when I look back um, over the course of the past few days to where we were a week ago and where we are now, the volatility has been really quite startling. I mean, when I was speaking to you a week ago, um, the FTSE 100 um, had just broken this trend line here. Now I've taken it out but I'll quickly pop it back in for you to give an indication of the extent of the move that we've seen over the course of the past few days. When I was talking to you a week ago, um, the FTSE 100 was around about here. And I suggested that we had the potential to retest the 6800 level. Well, I didn't expect that to happen within um, a couple of days of me recording this video, but that's essentially what happened. And even though we actually tested below that 6,800 level, we've come back to within touching distance of the 7,200 level um, in the space of a few days. The Wednesday rally, I think, you know, while it was driven by hopes of a ceasefire, you know, the prospect of a ceasefire still remains as far away as ever. Um, the meeting between the, the the Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov and his Ukrainian counterpart Kaleba um, turned out to be as about as much use as a chocolate teapot. Um, I think there was I don't think there was any indication that Russia was interested or is interested in a diplomatic solution. I think it's largely optics. Um, Russia still. Um, is making advances, albeit at a great cost. I think this talk of chemical and biological weapons is very, very concerning. It's going to be very diff difficult, I think, for NATO to ignore any such use of potential weapons. And, and as such, I think the outlook very remains very, very concerning going forward. And that is likely to mean that we're going to have to get used to further um, face ripping volatility. Um, the fact that we saw a, a 12 month low or a 10 month low for the FTSE 100 and an equally stark rebound is testament to that. Um, but ultimately we're still, we're still trading very much on a technical basis. Um, the technical levels are holding. Yes, you are getting a little bit of an overshoot, but that's not surprising. Markets always overshoot to the upside or the downside when you're faced with this sort of headline risk. Um, you know, that, that unfortunately is inevitable. So on the downside for the FTSE 100, if we look at a weekly chart, we can see that the technical levels continue to hold more broadly. So 6,800 on the downside. If we are going to get a rebound, then I really want to see the move back above 7,200 and for that level to hold. Um, so that's that's really the key resistance level on the top side when it comes to the FTSE 100 on a weekly basis. On a daily basis, it's pretty much the same and the 200 day moving average. And I think it's very, you know, it's very, very important in the wider scheme of things that these key technical levels hold on a daily and a weekly basis. This time last week, we were approaching 13,115 on the downside. 
And I said at the time that we were likely to get a retest of that. What I didn't think is was that we'd get it the very same day, or more or less the same day. We did. We've tested lower. We've gone back through it. We haven't gone back to the 50% level of 12,130. But I think while we're below 14,000 on the, on the upside, then the risks are we could well see a retest of that. We've seen a little bit of a rebound. We've seen a little bit of a pullback. Could this be a little bit of a reversal on the daily charts? It's possible, but we certainly saw that in the Wednesday rebound. But what we really need to see now is a recovery back above 14,200 to have any confidence that potentially the bottom is in. And at the moment, I don't have that confidence that the bottom, in it, that the, the, the bottom is actually in. Shouldn't, shouldn't have removed that. Let me just bring back the this week um uh watch list now in terms of the s p s you know us markets have been slightly more tempered in their response and the reason for that is purely a matter of geography um european markets are much more exposed to the headwinds of geopolitical headline risk us markets not so much and i think it's notable that we haven't as yet taken out the January lows that we saw um, earlier this year or, or the lows that we saw earlier this year in February rather we did take out the January lows in February on the S&P but what's significant was we actually didn't take out the 4100 so but we're still in the downtrend and that's important I think every bear market generally tends to have these really extreme rallies as markets pull off the lows and start to retest but let's make no bones about this you know in terms of the technicals we're still very much in a downtrend when it comes to equity markets in general we've got the makings of a death cross on the S&P 500 now I, I'm not going to read too much into that I think the bigger level on the S&P is this 4480 level because it happens to coincide with this line here but also the 200 day moving average more broadly and this horizontal line that I've drawn in here. So in terms of the technicals, all of the technicals and all the major indices are still painting to a sell the rally type of scenario. And that, you know, that doesn't look like it's going to change in the short to medium term. In terms of the NASDAQ 100, we're still very much in this downtrend here. But even if we do break higher, then you've got this 14,380 level through here. Um, so, you know, obviously we've seen we've seen a lot of the headlines when it comes to the sanctioning of UK uh, of Russian imports from the UK and the US. Germany is still very much um, reluctant to do that, given its reliance on Russian energy, um, and that needs to be taken into account in terms of the overall sanctions story um, you know, Europe more broadly is very much more reliant on Russian energy and if we look at the way Brent crude has traded this week we can see how how far the market has come in such a short space of time last Friday I talked about the 126 area as being a key resistance level well you know that level basically didn't even didn't didn't even hold and we've actually busted all the way through it this week. We haven't closed above it. What we've actually seen is a very stark move higher and then an equally sharp move lower for Brent prices. And we can see that through here. So the actual, it's actually bizarre that even though we've made a 14 year high for crude oil prices, we actually could finish the week lower. And when it comes to equity markets, when we've made some multi-month lows, the stark reality is we could actually finish the week higher. So that gives you an indication of how uncertain things are when it comes to try and pricing these markets. And that's why it means that you have to be very, very careful when it comes to entering and exit, exiting um, particular trades. You have to get your timing absolutely spot on. And certainly in terms of what commodity markets are telling me. They're telling me that while 
the risk is very much to the upside, we still remain very, very vulnerable to sharp counter trend reactions. And that's essentially what we saw on Wednesday. And we saw it in gold as well. We saw it very starkly illustrated in the gold markets. We retested the record highs of back in August 2020. We weren't able to get back through them and we corrected sharply lower. And that's a bearish engulfing candle, um, which suggests to me that potentially we could see a retest um, of the 1940 level. The 1965 level has thus far acted as support, which is this series of previous peaks through here. We got the test of the previous record highs. We weren't able to test or move back above them. We've seen a counter trend reaction to that test of those highs. And that would appear to suggest that positioning is very, very stretched when it comes to the gold market. And as such, that would suggest we also remain vulnerable to a retest of this 1965 and potentially a move back to 1940. Um, particularly given the fact that we've got the Federal Reserve rate meeting later this week, the Bank of England meeting later um, this month, rather, in the coming week. And we've just come off um, an ECB rate meeting, which delivered a little bit of a hawkish surprise um, when it comes to what the ECB might be doing when it comes to their asset purchase program. And there has been some surprise and maybe a little bit of criticism that perhaps the ECB is looking at potentially reining back its stimulus measures. And when I looked at Euro dollar a week ago, we didn't, we, we didn't even look as if we we're gonna come close to testing the trend line from the lows back in 2017. But we have actually tested that trend line. We were, we were well above 110. We've tested sharply lower and we've seen a rebound since then. And we've come back and retested these lows here at around about 111.20. So that's something that we really need to get back above in terms of the short to medium term to suggest that we won't see a retest of those lows. We look at that 111 area there, that's a significant resistance level on any pullback from that trend line support. Does that mean that we will not see another test of this trend line support? I think while we're below 111.20, I think it's quite likely that we will see a retest of that at some point. If we're able to get back above 111.20, then we could see a move back to around about 112 or 114. Again, it's about levels. Um, when it comes to um, currencies or any other market, it's trading around key levels. Last week, it was 114 on the upside. This week, it's going to be, or in the coming days and weeks, it's going to be 111.20 when it comes to where we go to next. So the key support on the downside is 107.70, 108. We saw a retest of that. We saw a test of that this week. We've recovered off that. If we look at the weekly chart, we're still looking very much at that being a key level and i talked about that last week we've managed to hold that level the big question is whether or not we can hold that level and prompt a little bit of a rebound and much will depend i think on what the fed says and does next week we are expecting a 25 basis point rate hike that is a given i think it would be very surprising if the fed didn't do um anything over and above that. I think there has been some talk of a 50 basis point rate hike. I think that's unlikely. In terms of what the Fed decides going forward, I think is going to be the bigger story. We'll get 25 basis points, but what will the Fed signal beyond that? People like James Bullard are talking about 1% by July. So another 75 basis points between now and July. What is the Fed signal with respect to that? What is the Fed signal about balance sheet reduction? Certainly in terms of the impact on the pound, we've seen a significant um, move below that 131.60 level that I talked about last week. And we've actually broken below that 
and I didn't expect that to happen. So that has caused me to shift my thinking when it comes to cable. Um, certainly in terms of euro sterling, it's also had a significant effect as well. You know, when the facts change, I change my mind. And my view on cable has, has always been very much a case of buying the dips. I'm being forced to revise that slightly because I didn't expect to see the move below 130, 160. And I think while we, be, while we are now below these reaction highs here, 132, 132.20, I think there's an increased risk now that we could move back to 128 and this blue line here. So, so if I think that we're going to see further sterling weakness, it then stands to reason that we could well see a continued test towards the downside in euro dollar. What the euro dollar chart is telling me at the moment is we've seen a significant rebound off that trend line support, um, which is a very, very key support level in the short to medium term, but cable started to break down. So essentially that means that euro sterling downside is likely to be much more limited. Um, so in terms of where we are at the moment, unless we see a significant rebound back above 132.20, then I think the risk of further sterling weakness has increased. And as such, we could see a retest of a break below 130 and then a test down towards 128 and a half in the short to medium term. Um, again, that will really depend on how hawkish the Bank of England is when it meets in the coming days. Certainly in terms of where we are euro sterling, we've seen an unwelcome rebound off these lows at 8280 in the 82 level here. And we've seen a retest of 8420, 8430. And we could come back as far as 84, 80, and even 85. We're still in the downtrend, but what we're seeing at the moment is a significant short squeeze on euro sterling, which could squeeze any sterling long positions. So the next level on euro sterling I'm really looking at is below this line here, the, the, the 200 day moving average as well. So we could see further sterling weakness and further euro strength in the short to medium term, depending obviously on how the Bank of England reacts at, this, at, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the meeting that's coming this week. So I talked a little bit about that. My expectations for the Fed are for the Fed to hike rates by 25 basis points. I also expect the Bank of England to do the same thing. It would be a big surprise if the Bank of England does nothing. I think when we look ahead at the inflation outlook, they have to do something. Now, you can argue whether or not they should, but the big question here for me, I think, is about the transitory playbook. People are talking about inflation being transitory. I think you can tear that argument up. The central banks are faced with a very difficult situation. Before the Russia invasion of Ukraine, some market pricing was suggesting we might see seven Fed rate rises this year. And while some are suggesting that might not happen now, there is an argument that it might be the lesser of two evils. Why do I say that? Well, the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve, they have to balance the risks of tightening too quickly and tipping the economy into recession or allowing inflation to do it for them. Either way, the economy, the global economy is heading towards recession, either as a result of higher energy prices or higher food prices or higher base metal prices. It's a you know, it, it's a question of which is the lesser of two evils. Do you anchor consumer inflation expectations by tightening monetary policy to basically head off inflation expectations one or two years down the line? Or do you allow inflation to let rip? You know, it's, it's a Gordian knot, if you like. There are no good outcomes either way. You either allow inflation to let rip and basically kill the economy that way, or you raise inflation or you raise interest rates and try and temper the longer term effects of higher inflation expectations by raising rates. Now, there are some people that say 
that you should basically just allow inflation to let rip. I tend not to be one of those. I think that rates have to go back to some sense of normalcy in order for central banks to be able to have the room to cut them later. Either way, in whatever you do, it's a it's a difficult situation and it's not like there are no good outcomes. So to my mind, central banks need to start to raise rates back to a normal set a normal level and even if the bank of england raises rates by 25 basis points next week they're only putting them back to where they were before the pandemic so they're not at an unsustainably high level you know if you, you know if your economy can't withstand 0.75 percent base rate or one percent base rate then where are we and the data that we've seen today out of the uk economy suggests that the uk the, the uk economy can withstand that notwithstanding obviously the price pressures of everything else and i think the one big risk for the uk economy at the moment is not so much the surges that we're seeing in energy prices and everything else it's the fiscal response from the uk government where we're getting tax rises coming in in april i mean that more than anything else is the bigger risk than what we're seeing from central banks more broadly so my expectation in a nutshell for next week is 25 basis points from the Fed. And then really a question is how they um, basically formulate their forward guidance for further rate rises going forward. And again, 25 basis points from the Bank of England with a risk that you might see some policymakers calling for 50. But ultimately, I think we're going to see further rate rises over the course of the next week or so. And then it's really a question of how the forward guidance kicks in therein after that we've also got uk wages data coming up next week and unemployment we're expecting to see uk unemployment fall back from 4.1 percent to four percent wage growth i think is the biggest concern here um, that's likely to um, see a fall to around about three well not four we slightly to stabilize at around about 3.7 percent um, excluding bonuses um with with bonuses 4.3 percent but again i wouldn't read too much into the wages data because that data is only up to january and over the course of the last few weeks and months we've seen a whole host of retailers announce above inflation pay rises which won't be factored into those numbers sainsbury's announced a 10 percent increase in its salaries Tesco 5.5%, all of these kick in in February, March and April. So average earnings and wages numbers are likely to come in and start to come in around about 3.74% and start to move up. And at the moment, all of the pay rises that have been brought in by various employers aren't currently reflected in the numbers that we're currently seeing from the Office of National Statistics. So we need to factor, we, we need to take account of that. We've got US retail sales coming out on the 16th of March. We saw a big rebound in January after a big decline of 1.9% in December. Um, we saw the fastest rate in 10 months rising by 3.8%, well above expectations of 2% in January. We're likely to see another fairly decent number of 0.5% in February. On the earnings numbers, what we're seeing in terms of um, next week, we're seeing Cineworld, Ocado and Deliveroo. If we look at Cineworld's share price, we can see that it's finding support in and around 26.5p, seeing a little bit of a rebound today on the slightly more positive risk sentiment, but we're still very much below the February highs had a shocker it's still got the overhang of its cineplex court case um where it's been told that it has to pay damages to the tune of 1.23 billion canadian dollars for lost synergies and 5.5 million dollars for lost transaction costs cine world is appealing um it's unlikely that that we're going to get any transparency on how that's going to play out over the course of the next few days. This week's guidance is likely to be key in terms of the overall 
picture, but even if it does post a decent set of numbers, it's still got that court case hanging over it. Um, Ocado, again, um, similar sort of story when it comes to the outlook there. Having a bit of a decent rebound today on the back of um, the ruling from the International Trade Commission about its auto store, um, its auto store uh, litigation. If we look at the downtrend here, we can see that we're seeing a little bit of resistance in and around this area here, as well as the highs back at the beginning of the month. Are the lows in? Difficult to say at the moment. The downtrend is still very much intact. And we've also got numbers from Deliveroo. And certainly Deliveroo isn't delivering, hasn't delivered, and is still within touching distance of record lows. So at some point, you've got to think that all the bad news there is priced in. In terms of the overall numbers, they're heading in the right direction. It's just that the share price isn't. So I think it's really a question of you know, how much lower can Deliveroo go before we start to see a little bit of a base start to kick in. Um, when you consider that it IPO'd at £3.90 and it's now within touching distance of being a penny stock, you've got to think, well, how much further has it got to go? And we'll find out whether or not its four-year numbers, which are going to be released on the 17th, will give us any indication as to whether the low is, is anywhere close to being um, put in. So I think that's pretty much it for this week. It's going to be a very, very interesting next few days, certainly when it comes to the Bank of England but and the Federal Reserve. But I think they're going to be, obviously, the key uh, macro announcements away from, obviously, um, continued concerns, headline risks, geopolitical concerns and events in Ukraine and any further horrors there. So, as I say, that's it for this week. Hope you all have a great weekend. Hope you've all had a decent trading week and I'll speak to you all same time, same place next week. Have a great weekend.